Hi everyone, how are we doing? We are at week 10 already of the semester, which is crazy. Uh, usually at around about week nine, week 10, students become exhausted, understandably. So I find that a lot of students find it a little bit more difficult to engage with the content in week 10, 11, and 12. So please make sure that you find strategies, one, to rest yourself, feed yourself, look after yourself, so that you have that time and energy to study. First question, can you see me and hear me okay? Can I get some responses on the chat? Is my sound quality all good? And is the visual quality all good? I'd like to know. And then we can get started into what the topic will be today, which is going to be the muscular system, which is a lot of stuff. All good, wonderful, thank you everyone. So, I've got my whiteboard, I'm in my office because usually the internet is better in my office. Uh, and I've drawn up two things, right? So I want us to look at this and this. Each of these is a single cell of muscle. This one is a single cell of skeletal muscle. And this is a single cell of a smooth muscle. Now, what I want to do in this particular tutorial is focus on bringing some concepts together. Uh, when it comes to the muscular system, there isn't a huge amount of stuff you need to know. Um, you'll see that there's a muscle list that you need to go through, and I had a couple of questions about the muscle list. You just need to know the muscles on that left-hand side column in that list, okay? And so they basically break it up into limbs, uh, torso or trunk uh, and lower limbs, all right? And some of the head and neck. There's not a lot there. So you need to just know where those muscles are located, all right? Uh, I might record a quick video actually looking at all those muscles and just highlighting exactly where they are and what they look like. It won't be a topic of today's shoot, but I will make it a separate video. Again, as usual, if you have any questions, please just pop it up in the chat and I'll answer them as we move through. Uh, but there is an important concept, which is understand the differences between muscle types and also the neuromuscular junction. But I thought the best way to approach this is to compare and contrast two major types of muscle, smooth and skeletal. And obviously, you all know that there's three muscle types, right? There's skeletal, smooth, and cardiac. Uh, I'm not going to focus on cardiac today. And the reason why is because next trimester, when we do AMP2, Cardiac goes for three weeks. The first three weeks of the trimester is all dedicated to the heart and pumping blood around the body. So you will know so much about cardiac muscle next trimester, so don't stress too much this trimester about it. But you do need to know about skeletal and smooth. Now the other thing about smooth muscle, so you all would have watched the lecture by now, so you know the basics of what the topic is for this week. Smooth muscle is muscle that lines hollow organs. Right, so I want you to think about this. Smooth muscle lines hollow organs, right? So it's, they're basically, they comprise muscular tubes. That's how I think about it. Smooth muscle is muscular. So can, I want a whole bunch of examples. Can you please tell me in the chat where you can find smooth muscle? Give me some examples. Where can you find smooth muscles? Especially knowing now that they line hollow organs. What do you reckon? Let's write a list. Uterus, yeah, absolutely. Uterus is a great one. Yeah, gastrointestinal tract, very good. Trachea, absolutely. Stomach, arteries. Respir the whole respiratory tract, yeah. All right, perfect. Intestines, so that's part of GIT. So yeah, stomach, GIT, gastrointestinal tract, is gonna be stomach and intestines, for example. All right, all of these are entirely accurate, correct. What I want you to tell me now is, what do they all have in common? So they all line hollow organs. Um, so the heart is cardiac, remember? There's three muscle types. Smooth, cardiac, and skeletal. So the smooth is going to be in these, so they're all hollow organs, right? 
uterus. Uterus is going to be basically what we term the womb, where the bub is going to be pushed out of. That uterus contracts, pushing baby out. Gastrointestinal tract, this is where we have foodstuffs moving around, so smooth muscle needs to contract, pushing things through. The trachea doesn't have a lot of smooth muscle. It's got small amounts of smooth muscle, but it still does have it at the back of the trachea, and it narrows and opens the diameter of the trachea. The respiratory tract, as we move down, has a lot more smooth muscle. Ciliary body of the eye. Tara, that's awesome. Yes, so smooth muscle in the, so the eye and the pupil, there's a ciliary body which helps constrict and dilate. And it's actually, it is smooth muscle, but it's different to the smooth muscle you'll find here. It's similar but different. And maybe if we have enough time, I can go through the similarities and differences. The stomach again, constrict and dilate. No, you, people think that the stomach is just a pit in which we drop food into and it sits there and acid digests it and it just sits there like this. The stomach has three layers of smooth muscle, right? It's got a, a layer that constricts it like this, a layer that constricts it like this, and a layer that constricts it like this. And so what the stomach is constantly doing is folding and jackknifing like this all the time. And that's why food stuffs get thrown up. And at the bottom of your esophagus, if that sphincter isn't tight enough, acid goes up into your esophagus and that's reflux. Now that sphincter that separates the esophagus from the stomach, that's also smooth muscle. So smooth muscle makes up all the sphincters of the body. So you may have heard of the term sphincter. Sphincter is basically smooth muscle arranged in a circle like that. And usually it's a barrier between one area and another. So let's just say we've got the stomach down here and the esophagus. You're going to have smooth muscle in a circular pattern separating out. Two, two distinct regions of the body. So from the stomach to the intestines, you're gonna have a sphincter as well, circular smooth muscle. So it separates boundaries in these hollow organs. All right, so this is perfect, but what do all these things have in common? Can anyone answer this? What are they all, apart from them all having smooth muscle, anything else you can think of that they all have in common? What do you reckon as I wipe this off? Any, uh, any takers? Yes, they all contract. Well, that's true. So all muscle, including skeletal muscle, they all contract. And when you say pump, I think what you're referring to is they're moving things through. So they're pushing things through. And that's true. So with smooth muscle, they basically push things through through a process known as peristalsis. So I'll talk about peristalsis in a sec. Um, what do we got? Uh, they are unconscious muscle. Georgia is entirely correct. Um, Jade's correct. Samantha's correct. Luana's correct. Yes, posture maintenance. So skeletal muscle is posture maintenance. Smooth muscle is not. So unconscious control. unconscious control. That's a big difference between the smooth muscle and the skeletal muscle is that you do not consciously tell this muscle to contract. You don't tell the uterus or the gut or the stomach or the arteries or the sphincters or trachea. You don't tell any of those things to contract. The body just does it. So in saying that, if it's involuntary, unconscious, what tells it to contract? Knowing what you know from all these couple of weeks, what tells it to contract? Obviously the nervous system, right? But what division of the nervous system is gonna tell it to contract? Parasympathetic nervous from Luana, that is one part of it. So yes, the parasympathetic nervous system does help control smooth muscle. Georgia says parasympathetic as well. Yes, that's true. What about sympathetic? Does the sympathetic nervous system tell smooth muscle to contract? What do you reckon? Yes or no? Does the sympathetic play a role in contracting any of these? Any takers? Yes, autonomic, yes. Yes, it does. So basically, the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system both play a role in telling these to contract, and that is autonomic. Remember, that's the autonomic division of the nervous system. That's what these two sit under, the autonomic division. They do not control skeletal muscle. Does anyone have any idea what type of neurons control skeletal muscle? To contract. What do you reckon? Do you remember from the other a few weeks ago what those neurons are called? The types of neurons that go down and tell muscle to contract? Motor. 
Yes, Siobhan, perfect. Motor neurons. So we will have motor neurons telling skeletal muscle con to contract and we will have autonomic neurons telling smooth muscle to contract. Perfect, perfect. All right, we're starting to build a picture here. All right, let's have a look at some other similarities and differences between skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. Let's now have a look at, we've spoken about where we can find them. Let's have a talk about the way they look, right? So if we look at skeletal muscle, first of all, it's cylindrical. Can you see it looks like a cylinder? Overall, it's got this cylinder-based shape to it, albeit inside of the cylinder-based shape, it's got all these individual tubes. Now these tubes are called myofibrils, right? So that there is called a myofibril. The whole thing is called a myocyte or a muscle cell. So, okay, so this whole thing you'll probably read has a couple of different names, right? You may read it as muscle cell. You may read it as myocyte, which again just means muscle cell, and you may read it as a muscle fiber. They're all the same thing. A muscle cell, a myocyte, and a muscle fiber all are the same thing. And they're comprised of these individual tubes called myofibrils. And inside of these tubes, you can see all these lines that I've drawn. These lines are proteins, and they're called myofibrils filaments. So the individual little fibers or proteins that we have inside are called myofilaments. So a lot of people get confused between myocyte or muscle fiber, myofibril and myofilament. So this is how I remember it. Muscle fiber, a fiber is the biggest one. A fibril is a small fiber. So it looks like just a small version of the muscle cell. Muscle fiber, the biggest. Myofibril, smaller. And then myofilaments, a filament, so filamentous component is just a small component of a myofibril. And they're just made up of these proteins. Now here's the thing. The proteins that make up a skeletal muscle, what are they? Does anyone know the two major proteins you need to know that make up skeletal muscle? What do you reckon? Any takers? The two proteins that make up skeletal muscle. They're the, what we call the contractile units of skeletal muscle. They're actually also the contractile units of smooth muscle. It, what, it's what allows muscle to contract. Calcium, not calcium. Calcium is an ion. It's not a protein. But actin is, so Siobhan's got one. Actin and myosin and uh, Maricel has both actin and myosin. Luana, correct actin. We need both actin and myosin. So Maricel has both correct. Perfect. All right. So can you see, when we look at the skeletal muscle, there's banded regions. All right. So you've got, if I were to focus in on one of these, right, and I'm going to draw one of these up. One, so remember, I'm going to pull out one of these myofibrils. This is a whole cell. Just a single cell, but it's a whole cell made up of... So, Please don't get confused. If I pulled one of these out, that's not a muscle cell. That's one small component of a muscle cell called a myofibril. I'm going to pull a single myofibril out like I did in the lecture and just focus on that for a second. In that myofibril, you've got a couple of things. So you've got different types of anchorage proteins. You do not need to know their name. I will not assess you on these anchorage proteins. I'll tell you the name now. You don't need to remember it. You can forget it forever. This is called the M-line, all right? Now, the, the way I remember M-line is because it sort of looks like an M, right? That's called the M-line. That's called the Z-disc, and the way I remember it is because it sort of looks like a, a Z. Now, all they basically are are proteins that are anchored into this myofiber. Uh, myofibril, sorry. Now the thing is this, the two proteins you, you do need to know, right? Actin. 
I'm going to draw one here. Actin, uh, sorry, myosin, which I'm going to draw here. This myosin is a thick filament. So let's draw it up like this. That's myosin. And we know that as being the thick filament. Right? Myosin. The thing with myosin is that they've got individual little heads on them. Look like little golf clubs, right? And you can see that the myosin is anchored to that M line. All right, so we've got myosin. That's the first protein, like I said, these little heads to them will look like little golf clubs. The next protein you need to know is the protein that's attached to the Z disc. And this is a thin protein, also known as the thin filament. And this is actin, right? So now we've got the thin filament, which is called actin. Now simply put, right, when we want muscle to contract, all we want to do is this. We want these little heads of the myosin. So these are called myosin heads, right? So the little ball attached to the arm here, that's called a myosin head. We want the myosin heads to attach to the actin filament. And this is what we want it to do. That's the actin filament. This is the myosin head. We want it to bind to the actin filament and pull it across. Then we want it to detach, cock its head, bind it, and pull it across some more. And keep walking its way across. And when it does this, it shortens the fiber. Think about it. If that myosin head binds to the actin and pulls it in, these Z discs get closer together. And if you do this across all of the myofibrils in the skeletal muscle, the whole skeletal muscle shortens. And that's what muscular contraction is. It shortens. Now, Georgia asked the question, I think it was Georgia. Uh, no, sorry, Jade asked the question, tropomycin and troponin. Yes, very important, let's have a look. Here's the thing, right? When we have, so I'm just going to do this a little bit better. So we've got myosin, myosin heads, and let's draw up actin. All right. So while we want the myosin head to bind to the actin and pull it in, Hopefully everyone's okay with that. The myosin heads can't just do it whenever it wants. There's a couple of things stopping it. So these are the things that are stopping it. First of all, there is a chain that's wrapped around the actin, like a bike chain, right? So think about it. You are the myosin head and you wanna hop on the bike and the bike is the actin. But the bike has a bike chain around it, which is attached to a pole. That bike chain is called tropomyosin. That bike chain is called tropomycin. But a bike chain is pointless without a padlock. So you need to lock that bike chain into place. That's troponin. So you're gonna find that there's all these troponin padlocks all throughout. I'm just gonna draw one up. That's called troponin. So here's the point, right? The myosin head wants to bind to the actin because when it does, it can pull it in and the muscle shortens. And when a muscle shortens, so this is skeletal muscle we're talking about at the moment, right? Skeletal muscle is called skeletal muscle because the muscle is bound to the skeleton. So my biceps, right? My biceps are gonna be attached up at my humerus and down on my forearm. So when that muscle contracts, what happens? It pulls on the bone. So the muscle shortens. So all I'm doing is getting the mice and heads to bind to the actin and they walk their way along the actin, pulling the actin in like you're pulling a rope in a tug of war and it shortens. All right, but there's a bike chain wrapped around it with a padlock. So we need a key. Keys open padlocks, right? So the key, does anyone know what the key is in this case? Somebody's mentioned it previously. What's the key that unlocks the troponin? It is 
Calcium unlocks the troponin to release the tropomycin, so the actin and mycin can bind. Shabon, you are perfect in your response. Maricel, perfect. Georgia, Nikki, you guys are wonderful. You got it. We need calcium. So calcium is the key. When calcium comes along, it unlocks the troponin. The bike chain falls away. The actin is free. The mycin heads combined. If we have ATP, all right? If we have ATP. So what that means for skeletal muscle at the moment, in order for skeletal muscle to contract, we must have calcium. We must have ATP. Skeletal muscle will not contract without calcium and it will not contract without ATP. So important. In actual fact, smooth muscle is the same. Now, here's a big difference. When we look at skeletal muscle, you can see that all the myofibrils are aligned in parallel. They sit on top of each other, boom, 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 which means all the myosin filaments are lined up together. Here, 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 right? And if you look at that under a microscope, because they are thick filaments, you get a dark banding pattern wherever the myosin filaments are, all right? So you've got this dark band, and that's what's called striations. If you look at this type of muscle under a microscope, you get these dark banded patterns, like that. And that's what's called striations. So what we say is skeletal muscle is striated. It's striated because of these dark banding patterns because all the filaments are lined up parallel to one another. All right, let's compare it to smooth muscle. All right, here's the thing with smooth muscle. Smooth muscle also has myosin, the thick filament with the myosin heads. It also has actin, the thin filament. But here's the thing. And we also do want the myosin heads to bind to the actin filaments and pull it in, so it shortens as well. But here's the other thing, right? When you look at skeletal muscle, you'll find that the myosin is anchored to the M line and the actin is anchored to the Z disc. That's where they're anchored. Smooth muscle doesn't have that. You can also see that the arrangement of the actin and myosin for skeletal muscle is parallel. Smooth muscle doesn't have that. You've got it arranged like that, and like that, and like that, and like that, and like that. In actual fact, what you'll find is that smooth muscle, the filaments are bound to these, see how I've drawn these little black dots here? They're these little dense segments, all right? So these dense proteins, these dense proteins, anchor the filaments. That's the first thing. Second thing is, the dense proteins are also connected to one another by these red lines that I've drawn, and they're called intermediate filaments. I'll tell you why we've got these intermediate filaments in a second. All right, a couple of differences there. So that means smooth muscle does not have striations. So smooth muscle no striations. And that's actually why it's called smooth muscle. Now we've got a question. Uh, is that to allow dilation and constriction of the channel rather than skeletal, which would shorten or lengthen the muscle? Yes, so, great point. So George has just asked, is the reason why smooth muscle has the filaments arranged in what looks like this random oblique sort of assortment compared to parallel is because of its function is different. Yes, think about it like this. Skeletal muscle touches bone to bone or muscle to muscle, right? Or, so basically, the muscles can attached ultimately to the skeleton. When it shortens, it moves the bone like a lever. And that's 
how we move, right? That's how we do everything that we do because of the parallel arrangement. But with smooth muscle, let's take the gastrointestinal tract for an example because this is really important. The gastrointestinal tract we know is a tube. So if I were to just draw up the tube, like we're looking through the tube, you're gonna have arrangements of smooth muscle around the tube. Right? But in actual fact, if I were to just sort of extend the tube out like that, you're going to have smooth muscle arranged around the tube, and that's actually called circular smooth muscle because it goes around a circle, but you've also got smooth muscle arranged in the other direction that goes the length of the tube, and that's called longitudinal smooth muscle. And I'm talking specifically here in the GIT. So this is, let's say this is the intestines. Right? This is the intestines. Circular smooth muscle, longitudinal. Can anyone tell me why in the intestines you have two different types of arrangement of smooth muscle? You've got some that goes around the tube and some that goes the length of the tube. Why? Why do you think? I'm gonna have a drink of water while you answer that question for me. Any idea? What do you reckon? Um, to squeeze and push. Ah, oh, Georgia, perfect. Maricel, peristalsis. Jacob, to move, so Jacob says to move in both directions, which is partially true. Mainly, we want movement in the intestines to be unidirectional. We want it to go, for example, from the stomach to the large intestines by going one way through the intestines. We can have something called reverse peristalsis, but that's when we vomit, all right? So it's very rare. Okay, so George's and Maricel's answer is correct. I like George's answer. So it's because we want to squeeze and push. Think about it. When that circular smooth muscle contracts, what happens to the diameter of the lumen, you know, the hollow inside? It gets smaller, so it squeezes what's ever inside. So if there's food stuff in there, we squeeze it, right? Then the longitudinal, when that contracts, it shortens the tube. So what happens is you get squeezing, so you get narrowing and shortening. And when that happens, things move through. That's how you move food, for example, through the intestines. You squeeze it and segment it, and then you put push it by shortening. Squeeze, push, squeeze, push, all the way through, and that is peristalsis, right? And so the question was before, is the way that it's arranged because of what it needs to do? Yes, because it needs to go in all directions, right? When skeletal muscle, one direction, contract, move a lever, move a bone. Here, we want stuff to move its way through. So if you have a look, these will still contract the same way, right? And so your question may be, and I'll answer your question in a sec, Jade, about the respiratory tract both ways. With the respiratory tract, the, the thing that moves air is pressure, not smooth muscle. All the smooth muscle does in the respiratory tract is alter what we call the caliber of the airways. So do we let more air in or less air in? It's not about moving substances in a particular direction because air, being a gas, Gases only move due to pressure, gas pressure changes. Physical substances like food and liquids move due to physical pushing, right? Hopefully that makes sense. Let me know, Jade, if that does make sense. Okay, so we've got these proteins and when they contract, it's exactly the same. Mice and head, bind, pull, detach, bind, pull, detach. It also needs calcium and ATP, but there's no troponin, and you don't have to worry about tropomycin. There's something called calmodulin, all right? So this is the difference between this and this. Instead of there being, so remember, let's draw this up. Myosin, myosin heads, right? Actin. And I said to you, for skeletal muscle, 
you had tropomycin, right? You had that chain around it and you had troponin as the lock. You don't have that for smooth muscle, all right? So there's troponin, there is no troponin for smooth muscle. There's still tropomycin, but what we have is when calcium comes in, it needs to bind to something called calmodulin. Calcium plus calmodulin, they'll come in together and they'll unlock the chain and let that whole thing occur. So what's the difference, right? Let's, let's look at the differences. Let's just actually write the differences. In order for muscle, skeletal muscle specifically to contract, you need calcium and ATP. For smooth muscle, you need calcium and ATP. Skeletal muscle has troponin and tropomyosin. Smooth muscle has Tropomycin. There's actually other things, but I really don't, it's just distracting if I talk about it. In addition to this, smooth muscle has calmodulin. And that needs to bind with calcium in order for the contraction to occur. All right? So there's some of the major differences. All right. Hopefully, if you've got any questions, please just ask those questions. Otherwise, I'm going to move on because I want to talk about some really important clinical points when these muscles contract. Oh, no, next point. Sorry. You need to talk about how does the actin, the muscle, go to the actin and move it all the way across. All right. All right. Take a look. There's a myosin head. There's the actin. All right. Let's say we're looking just at skeletal muscle. Let's say calcium's come in and it's released. It's unlocked the troponin. The tropomyosin chain has fallen away. So what's happened is troponin's gone. Tropomycin's gone because calcium has done that. So that's all moved away. So now we've got free actin to bind to and we've got the myosin head. All right, how does the myosin head bind and move? This is what happens. We need, this is where ATP comes along, right? So, ATP being the energy currency of the body, it comes along and it binds to the myosin head. It's the first thing. ATP binds to the myosin head. Once ATP is bound to the myosin head, ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate, right? There's an adenosine with one, two, three phosphates. That ATP will remove one of its phosphates. So it turns into ADP, adenosine diphosphate. A, D, P, and it keeps the phosphate attached there. When ATP goes to ADP plus the phosphate, the head cocks into position. So going from ATP to ADP and phosphate, so here, neutral position, ATP binds, turns into ADP and phosphate. Cooks the head. The ADP and phosphate will leave. Once the ADP and phosphate have left, the master head moves back in the neutral position, but it remains bound to the actin. So what does it need? More ATP. 
ATP comes along and binds to the myosin head. It pops off. ATP turns into ADP and phosphate. Cox into position. ADP and phosphate are released. The head goes back to normal position. What do we need? More ATP. Comes along and binds to the myosin head. Pops off. Turns to ADP and phosphate. Cocks its head. ADP and phosphate. Contracts. What do we need? ATP. And it just keeps going on and on and on and on. Um, Samantha's asked, um, when your touches your neck, the same. Oh, sorry. That's because I've got this ridiculous microphone here. I'll try not to rustle it up a little bit. I'm sorry about that, Samantha. Maybe I can, I'm sorry if this leads to a rustling sound. I do apologize. Maybe I can do something like this. Well, let me give it one more shot. All right, hopefully this is a bit better. Is this okay? Can I move around and that's okay? No troubles? What do you think, Samantha? All good? Please. Uh, it's when you put your arms up, demonstrating it's good, better, cool. So I can start doing this, is that okay? All right, no troubles? How's that? All right, so hopefully that makes sense. I know that it probably won't to begin with, you just gotta keep practicing it. I'm gonna say it one, okay, let me say it one more time. One last time, ready? Mice and head, actin. Don't turn off the YouTube channel. I know this is boring, but you've got to do this one, right? Actin, sorry, myosin, head, actin. We want that myosin head to bind, but we need ATP. ATP binds to the myosin head. It turns to ADP and phosphate. Cocks its head, binds. ADP and phosphate disappear. It goes back to normal position. It's stuck. The myosin head will not leave the actin until another ATP molecule comes along. When it does come along, it disassociates. Then it hydrolyzes to ADP and phosphate, cocks its head again and binds. Then ADP and phosphate leave, shifts the whole thing back. Now here's the thing about rigor mortis. Has anyone heard of rigor mortis before? Rigor mortis is about 12 hours after death, the body or the muscles of the body become very stiff, rigid and hard. The muscles contract. That's called rigor mortis, meaning contraction after death, right? So what's happening here is this. When you die, your cells, this is actually an interesting thing. What is death, right? How do we classify biologically death? You could say when the brain stops working. Yeah, but you're going to have cells that are still working when the brain turns off. Okay. Um, when somebody can't, when they're not conscious. Okay. Maybe it doesn't happen. Um, what causes, I've talked about that in a sec, Maricel. Um, so, when you die, the cells of your body release calcium. You get this huge calcium release upon death. We don't know why, but we do. And it's one of the ways we can determine death cellularly is through calcium release. So, if calcium releases throughout the whole body when you die, all the troponin and tropomycin chains from your skeletal muscle are released. You've got free actin. You've got ATP in all your cells, right, when you're dead. You're not making any new ones, but you've got ATP stores there. So the ATP causes the cocking of the head and the binding and the contraction. But after a certain amount of time, this muscle's contracting, you run out of ATP. Because you're, you're dead, you're not making any more ATP. And I just told you that in order for the head to detach from the actin, we need more ATP. But when somebody's dead, no more ATP. So it's stuck. So you remain rigid upon death. And then over time, over a number of hours, the affinity of that myosin head to the actin just becomes weak and falls away. And that's what rigor mortis is. It's simply the fact that all this calcium is released upon death and the muscle's free to bind. The ATP stores that are remaining causes contraction, but without any more ATP, it won't release. The question from Maricel is, what causes ATP to turn into ADP 
and phosphate, enzymes. So there are enzymes, you don't need to know them in this process. It's, it's called, it, it hydrolyzes. It's a hydrolyzation reaction in which this occurs, right? This is where all the energy is in the splitting off of ADP and phosphate. Okay, let's now talk about, any questions at the moment with all that? Because um, I want to talk about now how neurons come in so we can weave in the nervous system into this. Uh, why is there so much ATP left in our muscles? Um, only contain like five to six seconds worth. Yes, so George has asked an awesome question. In actual fact, we've only got like three seconds worth of ATP in our muscles. So if you go to the gym and you lift some weights, all the ATP that's sitting there remains, uh, is gone. All, that's, all the ATP that's sitting there has now gone. That's it, after three seconds. So we need to find ways of regenerating ATP. Now there's immediate ways of doing this and there's long-term ways of doing this. The immediate ways, where does the ADP and phosphate go? Uh, this, okay, this answers both questions, right? You use up all your ATP in three seconds telling your muscles to contract. Now, to answer George's first part of her question, why does rigor mortis occur if you only have three seconds ATP, is because the muscles will contract of three seconds worth of muscular contraction, which is enough to tell every muscle in the body to contract. But without regenerating more ATP, right, without regenerating more ATP, the mice and head is bound and stays bound. So you stay contracted, right? But in you or I, living individuals, right? We need to replenish ATP stores because you don't go to the gym for three seconds. You don't walk in, do three seconds of dumbbell curls and walk back out again, right? You're in there for what, 30, to, 30 minutes to an hour doing whatever you're doing. You have energy replenishment. This is the main way that it happens. There's something in your body called creatine. Probably all heard of creatine. Probably heard of the supplement creatine, right? This is one of the ways that this supplement works, right? When you're resting at home, your cells are still making ATP. Now, what do we do with this ATP that's just sitting there? It's not being used when you're resting, but it doesn't like being stored as ATP itself. So what it does, interestingly, is it gives one of those phosphates to creatine. And so what ends up happening is when ATP gives the phosphate to creatine, creatine becomes creatine phosphate and ATP becomes ADP. But what it also means is we now have in your muscle cells this big storage of spare phosphate. So what happens is when you use this ATP for energy, after three seconds, it turns to ADP. But luckily, this reaction is reversible. And the creatine phosphate gives that phosphate back to ADP and we replenish our ATP and create more. And this gives us more seconds worth of ATP, right? So this process constantly happens. Then we've got time to continually regenerate more ATP. The long-term regeneration of ATP is through glycolysis, this is taking glucose and turning it into ATP or, or and oxidative phosphorylation, which you guys don't need to know about this trimester, which creates even more ATP. In actual fact, both of these two, glu glu uh, glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation, both of them happen to produce together about 36 ATP molecules for one single glucose. All right, so it's a very efficient reaction and we can make heaps of ATP from glucose in our muscle cells. Um, so the more creatine, the better. I wouldn't say that because creatine can have its damaging properties. It has a very high tolerable, tolerable um, uh, um, quantity, but there are some negative effects that have. So creatine holds onto lots of water. That's why a lot of people who take creatine get quite big. And a lot of that's water volume, 
right? Because of the hydrolyzation events that happen here. Um, and there's some questions about the role that creatine plays in the kidneys. So you get creatine from food you eat. So there's heaps of creatine in meats and so forth, right? But people supplement with creatine if they tend to overtrain. Um, I wouldn't say more creatine is better because you, everything's in a balance, right? So there's always a happy, healthy range, and that's where we want to be. Too much, not good. Too little, not good. What the quantity of creatine is, is another question that I can't answer. Um, you had said we source creatine from predominantly animal products. What about vegans? Good question. Um, I am not sure, I'll have to investigate that, Georgia. That's a great question. I'm not sure what products, non-animal based products, contains high amounts of creatine. I'm sure there is, but I know that most of it comes from meat. So I'll look into that, because that's a very good question. Um, uh, what happens for the skeletal muscle to reset and the troponin to reattach to the tropomycin? As soon as the, cal so calcium that's released, right? Calcium that's released to tell the troponin to jump off and the tropomycin to jump off. As soon as the calcium gets pulled back into the storage unit called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, the troponin and tropomycin jump back on, right? So calcium will mediate whether this contraction is occurred. That's why I'm saying you need two things, calcium and ATP for muscle to contract. If you only have one, not gonna happen, right? So this skeletal muscle, and I haven't drawn it up here, right, is surrounded by what looks like these big, dense, tube-like networks called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So you know that cells of your body have the endoplasmic reticulum. Muscle cells have an endoplasmic reticulum, but they're called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And all you need to know is the sarcoplasmic reticulum contains calcium. That's where all our calcium is stored for skeletal muscle. For smooth muscle, calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum. But most of it comes from extracellular stores. So it jumps in from outside the cell for the smooth muscle. For skeletal, most of it comes from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. All right, let's talk about innovation, how the nervous system plays a role here. This is what I think is the interesting stuff. Any questions before we move on? If you do, just pop them down. Can I have another quick drink of water? Okay, what do we got? Uh, about lactic acid, from my understanding, it can provide energy, is that right? In Japan, they drink lactic acid, yuck. I agree, that does sound yuck. Um, wouldn't it be easier to get energy from food than waiting to produce lactic acid? My answer is yes. I think it's far better to get your energy from food than from other sources. We've evolved to get our energy from food. Lactic acid, Okay, I'll, I'll quickly tell you what lactic acid is. We'll pretend this is a bit of a break, an intermission. When you take glucose and you break it down to make energy, you produce something called pyruvate. Now, pyruvate jumps into the mitochondria. Now, this is where that... So this process here just for relevance, is glycolysis. This is what we're talking about to produce, and it spits out some ATP. When the pyruvate goes into the mitochondria, it undergoes oxidative phosphorylation and spits out more ATP, all right, just for the relevance. But in order for pyruvate to create ATP in the mitochondria, you need oxygen, right? But sometimes we do exercise where we need more ATP then we have oxygen available. What type of exercise would this be? What do you guys reckon? What type of exercise would you need more ATP than you have available oxygen? What do you reckon? Cardio? I would say not cardio, because cardio usually, you know, you go for a run, you get to breathe in, do all the energy. It would be short burst stuff. 
us. It would be sprints, right? Sprinting, or it would be getting a big heavy weight and lifting it really quickly, right? You need that energy straight away and you don't have enough oxygen to recoup. If you're going for a long distance run, you get to breathe and you the muscle contractions that are occurring, they're not happening really fast and quick, right? So HIT, for example, so uh, yeah, Shaborn and Talani saying HIT workouts, right? High intensity in interval training. This is where you go bam and you smash that workout, the muscles get exhausted quick. So when you do these types of short burst energy exercises, you don't have enough oxygen to make the ATP. So it can't go through here. It goes glucose to pyruvate, it jumps into the mitochondria and it can't undergo oxidative phosphorylation. The oxidative part says it needs oxygen. So we need another pathway. So it jumps out here and produces lactic acid. Right? Now, at the same time producing lactic acid, you can produce some ATP. But now you've got all this lactic acid built up in your body. Great thing is, lactic acid jumps back into that cycle, all right? So lactic acid is a secondary or a byproduct of creating ATP with no oxygen. See, ATP with oxygen, this is ATP with no oxygen. And that's the lactic acid production side and we recycle the, the lactic acid. So by ingesting lactic acid, which seems to be what you were stating before, um, Cindy, you are replenishing stores. Just eat some glucose, right? Um, all right, there's our intermission. Let's now move on. Any more questions? Let me know if you have any more questions. And we'll start talking about nervous innovation. Hopefully that made sense, Cindy. All right, this will be the last thing we talk about because we are at nearly one hour. So. Here's the thing, let's drop a spinal cord. So this is merging a couple of concepts together, which I love doing. This hopefully helps you all. There's no point talking about thing, these things in discrete chunks. How long, uh, how long do we have as study break before the exams? Um, not long. I think you have week 12 and I th think you've got something like four days, five days. That's your study break before the exams begin. That's just how the university and central exams have timetabled it, right? So it's, yeah, I think it's like four to five days you have as, a, as the study week, um, which is unfortunate. But you guys will be fine. I'll give you a practice exam and you guys will knock it out of the park. All right, we're talking about so three days, even less than what I thought. Thank you, Juliet. Wow. Um, so remember with the spinal cord, we're talking about muscles to contract. So I'm gonna ask you a question. Is this gonna be an afferent signal or an efferent signal? Signals that go from the spinal cord to muscles to tell them to contract. Afferent or efferent? What is, which one is it? I need something that plays the Jeopardy music. Do, 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 do. Georgia Efren, exactly right. So, in saying that, if I'm gonna draw up the spinal nerves, okay, so knowing what you know, everyone's correct, efferent, okay. This is dorsal, this is ventral. Same for that one. Is this signal coming out of the dorsal sp spinal nerve or is this signal coming out of the ventral spinal nerve? George is smashing it out of the park, ventral, 100%. What's happening at dorsal spinal nerves? What signals are that? What type of signals are sent through do uh, dorsal spinal nerves? Ventriloquists, thank you Talani. Okay, so uh, a ventriloquist signal is coming out of the ventral spinal nerve. <laughs> yes, sensory and pain, that's right. <laughs> autocorrect, I'll assume it's autocorrect, don't worry about that. All right, perfect. So motor always comes out ventral, 
sensory always goes in dorsal. So we're now gonna focus on what type of neurons are sending signals to skeletal muscle, what type, what type of neurons sending signals to smooth muscle. All right, so I'll use a blue pen here. Let's start with skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle is all muscle of our body that we consciously control, right? So they're gonna be coming out of our spinal nerves and they're gonna be motor neurons. And I told you previously that there's two motor neurons descending from the brain. One that comes down, and let's just look at the lower motor neuron. It's gonna synapse at the ventral gray horn. Sends a signal out. Here's a motor neuron. Right, there's a motor neuron. It's coming down. Now here's the thing, here's the amazing thing. This is a single muscle cell. This is not multiple muscle cells, this is just one muscle cell. What happens with a motor neuron is it branches. And you have a single synapse for a single motor cell, for a single muscle cell. But the motor neuron has multiple branches and it's gonna synapse with multiple muscle cells. So for example, I'm gonna drop up another one. Here's another muscle cell. Here's another muscle cell. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that one motor neuron will have multiple terminals. Each terminal will synapse with a single muscle cell. And all of these muscle cells will probably be together in one big muscle bundle, right? So for example, all this could be my biceps. That could be one muscle cell in my bicep, that could be another muscle cell, that could be another. Each individual muscle cell is innervated by its individual synapse, but many can come together from one motor neuron. Now it doesn't mean that my biceps is innervated by only one motor neuron. There will be multiple motor neurons coming out. So what we call this, when a single motor neuron innervates multiple muscle cells, we call the, the accumulation a motor unit. That's a motor unit, right? All right, here's the next thing. When it comes down, what this does is the neurotransmitter it releases is acetylcholine. Acetylcholine. Remember, we've spoken about nervous system and action potential needs to be sent down here. So this is sodium ions jumping into the cell in this domino-like effect. When this action potential reaches the terminal here, it causes calcium channels to open up and calcium will jump into the terminal. It's the calcium coming into the terminals that cause the acetylcholine to be released. All right? One, action potential down the motor neuron. Two, this action potential causes calcium influx into the terminal. Three, calcium causes these vesicles, these bubbles that contain neurotransmitters to be released into the synapse. Four, the uh, acetylcholine will bind to acetylcholine specific receptors on the muscle. Five, when acetylcholine binds to the acetylcholine receptors, it opens up more sodium channels and sodium will influx, causing another action potential. Just like what's happening down the neuron, it stimulates it at the muscle cell. But here's the difference. If I were to take the muscle cell and you get sodium coming in, to depolarize it, we know that in order for this muscle to contract, we also need calcium. And calcium is stored in these big storage pits called the sarcoplasmic reticulum that I mentioned earlier. There's calcium in here. So when the sodium influxes, it will influx down the sarcoplasmic reticulum and cause calcium channels to open up and calcium will be released all throughout the muscle cell. So calcium gets released, so sodium comes in only across the membrane, not deep in the muscle, right? Sodium only comes in across the membrane. 
But because there's these big deep channels that go all throughout the muscle that contain calcium, calcium is released throughout the entire muscle. So it doesn't matter about the sodium, it just matters about the calcium. The sodium is what triggers the calcium to be released everywhere and all the muscle contracts, not just the superficial ones, all the muscles contract in the manner that we spoke about before. This junction here between the neuron and the muscle is called the neuromuscular junction. And I released a video on it and I uploaded it onto the Facebook page for you. <laughs> so I recommend watching that because it talks a little bit more about the detail. <clears throat> I want to compare that to the smooth muscle. Let me know if you have any questions at the moment about the skeletal muscle. All right. Now, how is this different with the smooth muscle? Well, we're not using a motor neuron. We're using an autonomic neuron. So this is the autonomic nervous system, sympathetic, parasympathetic, right? So what's gonna happen is, we know that these cell bodies are located in the lateral gray horn, and they will come out of the ventral nerve root, and we've spoken about it before, they synapse at ganglia. Remember? Remember we spoke about the autonomic nervous system? There's one neuron and it speaks to a second neuron. And we compared both the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And I said that for the sympathetic nervous system, you've got acetylcholine as a neurotransmitter. For the parasympathetic, you also have acetylcholine. For the sympathetic at the end, you have noradrenaline. And for the parasympathetic, you have acetylcholine again. So this first neuron here is this first neuron here. This second neuron is this one here. And what this neuron does is it will go to the smooth muscle. All right, here's another amazing thing about smooth muscle. Is that when you've got smooth muscle, let's draw up a couple of different smooth muscle, smooth muscle. So they look like eyes, right? They've got this tapered edge. Smooth muscles, smooth muscles, smooth muscles. Okay, did you know that smooth muscles are connected to one another through these gap junctions? Right? They're connected to one another through these gap junctions. And the reason why this is important is because they don't have the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So when the action potential hits the skeletal muscle, the calcium gets released everywhere so you get the whole contraction. Here, and you need every single muscle cell needs its own innovation. But for smooth muscle, you only need to really innovate one or a couple and it propagates the action potential to all smooth muscle. All right, really important. But here's the other really cool thing. If we were to look at the, the uh, let's say the intestines, right? So let's draw this up as though it's the intestines. Actually, let's draw it up a little bit better. All right, let's connect them with gap junctions. So let's just say We've got this autonomic nervous system, parasympathetic innovation to the small intestines. Here's the great thing, right? You've got a plexus. Remember I told you what plexuses are. They're gonna be bundles of nerves coming together. You've got all these different plexuses in your stomach. You've got, you've got an entire nervous system in your stomach, which is amazing, right? So let's just say that this is coming out and it's innovating here. Right? It's the parasympathetic nervous system. It's releasing acetylcholine. Cool. What do these things do? These neuroganglia. They're going to innovate this muscle. But here's something awesome, right? This is in a hollow tube. So let's just say, if I can draw it up properly, they're the muscle 
on the outside of the tube. Here's the inside of the tube, that's on the outside. So just imagine this muscle here is going all the way around the tube, okay? Hopefully this makes sense. And I've got some food in here that I wanna move in that direction. How do we do this? This is the, this is the crazy thing, right? These neurons know where this food is because as the food moves through, it stretches it. And when it stretches it, it speaks to these neurons. And what these neurons do is the neurons behind the food release neurotransmitters that tell the muscle to contract behind it, pushing it forward. The, the neurons in front of the food release neurotransmitters that relax, so that in front it relaxes. So the behind it pushes forward, in front it relaxes. Then when this stretches the next part, behind it contracts, ahead it dilates. Is exam going to cover the whole module from 1 to 12? Yes, whole module 1 to 12. All right, so as this releases behind, it contracts. So the neurotransmitters that contract in smooth muscle are acetylcholine and substance P. They're the two neurotransmitters that contract in smooth muscle. Neurotransmitters that relax in smooth muscle, I'll just tell you one, is nitric oxide. All right? And so what they do again, just to reiterate, and this is where I'll finish, is that if you've got food moving through, the food moves through the hollow tube, it stretches the tube where that food is, right? Stretches. Stimulating these neurons. Behind, it releases constriction neurotransmitters to tell the muscle to contract, which is acetylcholine. but also substance P, which was spoken about in the neurotransmitters lecture. It's, that is activated for pain too. It contracts behind. In front, it releases neurotransmitter to relax the muscle and that's nitric oxide. And then as it moves, and this is peristalsis. So this is the process of peristalsis, right? In which contracts behind, relaxes in front. All right, I think we might finish it there. Any questions before we finish up? Otherwise, thank you. I will, I agree Talani, I think it's very cool that we've got these amazing nervous system innovations that release different neurotransmitters to do different things. Um, thanks everyone, uh, enjoy the rest of your week and I'll speak to you soon. There's a quiz that's open, but it's open for two weeks. All right.